among the races and peoples of mankind. But in the process, having lost all political authority and presence in Great Britain, they turned toward commerce and science and the business of tending their own church and more or less silently, without any leaders ever saying so, seemed to abandon all the efforts to control the largest society. Separate church and separate state, which Calvin established really in his argument that this church can protect its own altars, and that the state has no business trying to tell the church who to let in and who to let out, and how to govern itself. The governance of the church, which, as we know, expanded into Arminianism to a great extent, and the governance of the state became two different things. And, in fact, a whole philosophy, a whole argument of ideas arose saying that this was a good thing and that this was the way it should be. And the diminution the diminution of the Calvinist dream took place in subtle stages and was almost unnoticed. And Dr. Kelly spoke about the largeness of the Puritan effort, of the fact that they felt that all areas of life and thought belonged to God and that all areas should reflect that, became narrowed down. I don't have the time, of course, to go through all the stages of that particular declension. We know that Christianity in the United States, which at one time was the driving force behind the war of independence with Great Britain, has gradually been isolated from public life until now it is almost outlawed, almost officially outlawed. And this in itself is part of what we inherited from the long-range failure of the First Reformation and the Cromwellians to establish a lasting Christian control over Christendom. Let's not fool ourselves. The rise of the Puritans was a great triumph and the fall of the Puritans was a great defeat. And it's our task to analyze both the successes and the failures of history so that we can repeat the one and avoid the other. Now, I agree with the Puritans, and I agree with Augustine, and I agree with Calvin, and I agree with Rush Dooney, that it's a fallacy to divide the world into the spiritual and the physical. That's a Greek idea, not a Christian idea. Augustine's city of God was not in the sky or in the hereafter, but here on earth, where angels intermingle with the world of men and with God's other creations. And the presence of God in the affairs of this world are not always visible in an immediate sense, but over a period of time they become unmistakable in terms of sin and in terms of virtue. The French Revolution, which I talked about earlier, still is a very attractive vision to many. <clears throat> but it leads always to a loss. Cromwell, after he left, left no heir. The movement deteriorated, disintegrated. And England, after Cromwell, might well have gone the way of revolutionary France because when Voltaire went over to London in 1715 with the proceeds of the French National Lottery, which he won, and which was the basis of his fortune, he ran into the English fashion of making fun of Christianity and the Christians, and he took that fashion back to France with him, and that began the Enlightenment, the anti-Christian, anti-religious Enlightenment. Meanwhile, in England, you had Wesley and Whitfield and their awakening, which recalled to them the need 
to recover some faith and which kept them from the cliff that France went into. But we do have to remember that one of the reasons the Puritan movement collapsed was because of the interior internecine arguments that arose within the Puritan army, within the Puritan House of Commons, within the whole Puritan movement. Fierce arguments. The soldiers would sit up all night over the campfires shouting at each other over their differing interpretations of the Bible. The world hasn't seen such arguments by such zealots until the internecine disputes of international socialism in the 19th and early 20th century. Only recently have the Marxists ceased to have those kind of arguments, and that's probably because they've lost their heart. It's no longer in their effort. It's not any longer driven by idealism, but by search for power. And there isn't much to argue about when it comes to power. The Christian progress was entirely different, and history shows you the difference between the revolutionary progress, which has gone deeper and deeper into the swamp, and the progress that attended the changes that the Puritans established. Puritan descendants, as I said, became those who didn't go into the clergy, became active in commerce. They didn't turn toward art, which I consider one of their deficiencies. The counter-revolution picked up the art, the counter-reformation, I mean, picked up art, and we sort of let it go. So we lost a great deal. We lost the theater, which Cromwell, by the way, reestablished before when he was in control. We lost the great world of entertainment, which has now been turned against us by the revolution. We lost a great deal of painting and sculpture. Earlier today, a young man told me that he was called to be a sculptor and he's also an elder in a church and he wondered if turning toward art would re amount to a rejection. And I said, how could you be accused of that if you're going to follow the vocation that God opened to you? The missionary effort remained and very effectively. And also the idea of Christian vocation went into the larger world and expanded the whole world of progress as we know it today. The eternal corporation of the church became corporations set up by private individuals, the corporations of commerce. I've had some experience in dealing with some of those corporations. I've uh, interviewed founders and inheritors of very large corporate structures. And I must say, they're more complex than a symphony orchestra. Diverse talents are all used and blended together toward a larger purpose. Even the men who are doing it now have no idea where it came from or why they respect one another's abilities the way they do. They don't realize that in the pre-Cromwellian world, occupations meant nothing and birth meant everything. So that was a breakthrough which carries on silently. Science, as Dr. Kelly told you, the scientists were Christians first, like Newton, Scientists second, and incidentally, Newton, for the balance of his long life, spent almost all his time exploring the science of the Old Testament. Stacks of his discoveries are in the British Museum, untranslated from the Latin, because the modern world decided that he had lost his brains when he got into that, and there was no sense looking into it. And all the changes that the Puritans brought in are seldom really traceable. But let's put it this way. As the old vocations, as the uh, hereditary vocations changed, as people were driven off the land, and they were driven off from the farm of the, high, of the lowlands of Scotland and from the farm lands of England, as industry began to came in, come in, 
the plowman turned into a factory worker. And it's very true that the first generation found this wrenching and painful. But it ended starvation and it was accompanied by the rise of new sanitation methods, medical, mechanical advances. An entire transformation of society began, first in England, the world's first industrial society, which then spread to the American colonies and around the world. And in the period from 1794, when Robespierre was finally killed by his own people in the French Revolution, to 1894, one century, you saw the greatest leap forward in the history of the human race. Not from the Revolution, but from the effects of the Puritans. Tremendous constructive changes which took place within Christendom and which were then exported by the Christians around the world, both the gospel and the inventions and the advances and the progress. Some historians like to talk about the fact that the Chinese invented ink, paper, paper money, <laughs> gunpowder. Yes, they did, but they didn't do anything with it. They didn't export those products to other people. They weren't interested in other civilizations. It was only the Christians that got onto ships and moved around the world and said to other people, here, try this. And this was all from change, innovation, new methods of doing things, new methods of work. Nothing as blazing as a revolutionary speech, but something that changed the way men lived, the way families were supported. Not without difficulty, not without opposition and criticism. The revolutionists and the socialists and the, many of the literati hated it. From Emerson to Dickens, the literati complained about these smelly factories and also complained about the nouveau riche, about the industrialists and the manufacturers and the people in the factories who were suddenly wearing clothes just as good as ours. Terrible thing. The living standards of the entire world were lifted up by the fruits of the Christian civilization. And as they rose, great resentment arose among the revolutionaries, including even men like Engels, who himself lived off the profits of manufacturing. Envy appeared wearing a mask of concern for the poor, and socialism began to replace religion for the intellectuals, because there's nothing an intellectual hates worse than to see somebody who hasn't got his degree prospering. And that trend, of course, accelerated by two world wars and their debacles, is with us today. Don't let the fact that the American intellectual calls himself a liberal deceive you. Dr. Dwight Murphy wrote a wonderful quartet of books unmasking the American liberals. He said in the end, they're all socialists. They agree with every tenet of the socialist movement. They just haven't got the courage to admit it, and they call themselves liberals. Now today we look at the results of these two things, the results of revolution, the results of change. Every country that bought socialism is now unable to feed itself. And only the nations which refuse the socialist answer are able to export the food to those nations that cannot feed themselves. What an example. It's as clear, it's, as, it's unbelievable, and yet, totally unnoticed. Why do the Soviets need our food? Why don't they make their own? Well, it's another story. We confront a world remade by the principles of the Reformation and the world of work, but lacking in the application of the same Calvinist principles in our government, our media, our universities, our Congress, and our courts. 
We have narrowed our inheritance, or our forebears did, and consequently our estate is not as large as it should be. The only reason we have been spared the regular left-wing revolution that occurred in other countries is because the innate conservatism of the American people, their religiosity, which maintains the largest and best attended churches in Christendom. But in the period since World War II, we have seen a remarkable decline in the numbers and caliber of those congregations, even though there has been a remarkable awakening on the part of people like myself and you. What we have been living through are the results of two particular developments which have been conducted over a period of several centuries. And we are now confronted with a very clear possibility that in the next great crisis that occurs to the United States, and we are all positive that a crisis will occur, that unless we have in place a Christian movement the left will roll over the rest of what remains of American liberty. And I say that because the pattern of the revolution has not changed. I have described it to you this morning. The runaway Congress, the corruption of the courts, which become subject to political winds, the capture of the universities, the distortion, the misuse of the media, underway here as it was underway in Paris, in St. Petersburg, in Berlin, in Havana, in Managua, and so forth. And by their capture of communication and the art, the revolution has the weapons that the Reformation once used. The Reformation used printing. Today the revolution uses radio, TV, and computers. Now, in my opinion, we're running toward the cliff. The clergymen call it judgment. Same thing. And we have to, like the Puritans, either allow the Arminians to go all the way and give us the total state, or we have to mount some sort of objection some sort of effort against it. Because it is, after all, our duty as Christians, and we hear this repeatedly, to carry our principles into every area of life and thought, and not simply to parts of life and parts of thought. And we cannot, in my opinion, rely only upon the clergymen among us. Their message is essential. And, and provides us with the spiritual sustenance that we need. But we also need to create social instruments to protect our faith from unbelievers in high places. Faith is not simply what Dr. Rush Dooney calls a fire insurance policy, but a way of life, a way of assessing the world and its behavior, a way to overcome folly and error, sin and evil, Paul said, we contend against powers in high places. How can we do this? How can we present a Christian alternative? How can we reconstruct the American society? To a certain extent, since we began from such a modest position, don't forget, Calcedon began 24 years ago, with a mailing list of less than a hundred people, a typewriter, and R.J. Rushdoony. And some have said, well, we can create our own society with its own schools and its own neighborhoods and its own publications and churches, and in effect repeat the pattern of the early church in the pagan society of ancient Rome. And there is much to that because you cannot have any kind of a movement without having a base. And the Christian schools and the home schools and the Reformed churches 
and the network that Dennis Turry talked about last night are essential. You can't have a movement unless it has a core. And this was the way the Jewish people maintained themselves amid an alien Christianity for centuries. Very well. They were successful much more often and for far longer in many more places than they were unsuccessful. They defended themselves and their faith kept them through the centuries. And we have inherited many centuries of Christian civilization. But the interesting division here is that this is a civilization in which we are the majority and not a minority. The fruits of this civilization were, conduct, were created by our forebears and not someone else's. We are neither strangers nor aliens in Christendom, but Christians in our own land. If the universities and the media, the courts and Congress, have moved beyond our control, deny the validity of our opinions and have grown hostile to us, we don't need a revolution. We know the terrible cost of revolution. We can look around the world and see that they have created nothing but ruin. We only need to change the leaders of our institutions. We don't need to destroy them. For instance, our most serious opponents are not in the streets, but in the universities. I don't have to tell you, you all know how inadequate our public schools are, our state schools, our government schools, however you want to describe them. Intellectual crimes are being committed there. And we have all sorts of books, monographs, reports, and speeches that criticize but do not improve. Well, we say we have a Christian school movement and we have a homeschool movement. But on the other hand, we are not going to live alone in this society. It's our Christian duty to help all children and not simply our own. Millions of American youths are being indoctrinated along ruinous paths. And we cannot stand by and watch this without lifting a finger. Charity, after all, does not consist only of giving people food, clothes, and money, but in helping to make their lives better along higher levels. Only Christians have spread the fruits of medical and technological research around the globe, and here at home we're confronted with the same obligation. We cannot allow the forces of spiritual destruction to continue to wreak havoc in this land without seeking to bring about a change. And let's, when we look at the schools, take a page from the book being written by Margaret Thatcher of Great Britain. Our feminists do not ex accept her as an example of feminine courage, brains, and ability. But she is. England hasn't had a woman like that since the first Elizabeth. And she looked at the government-supported schools of Great Britain, saw that they were no longer Christian, and that one of the main obstacles to their improvement was the entrenched power of the left-wing tenured teachers. So they passed through Commons a new Education Act mandating more Christian instruction in state-supported schools. Well, they could do that because officially and technically England is a Christian nation. It has an established church. They have bishops in the House of Lords. We can't do that. But she did do something else which I think we might think about. Beginning in November 1987, no new teachers could receive tenure in an English university. And then in the next paragraph of the same act, it says, neither clerical nor teaching staff will be safe from dismissal for reasons of economy, redundancy, or inefficiency. 
all of a sudden, one fell swoop off with her head. <laughs> I called the executive editor of the Conservative Digest and said I'd like to write an article uh, suggesting that we end tenure in American public schools. Well, he said, I don't know, Otto. <laughs> I said, well, Maggie Thatcher's doing it. He said, what? He said, I haven't read that. I said, well, no, they're not going to write about their cousin losing a job. But I said, she did it, and I described it. He said, hey, that's a great idea. When can you have it? <laughs> We've lost something here. We used to be the first to take action. Now we have to see whether or not our cousins in Europe did it first. <coughs> but it opens up a whole new avenue of thought. Tenure is, of course, an old medieval custom. Well, actually, Rush showed me a book on the way up. He's always one book ahead of me, I say. <laughs> Which, they say, tenure was established and professorships and chairs endowed by the Greeks. And it was part of the Greek influence in Christendom that we've inherited. My impression was that tenure became quite important in the medieval period to protect the teachers from both the church and the state. Well, here, of course, they live off the state and they malign the church. I think it's inconsistent for any society that claims to be based upon merit, for any profession to be cemented into place, irrespective of behavior and competence, and beyond the control of people who pay for the services. And though we send our children to private schools, and though we have home schools, we're paying for the others, too. And we have as much right to talk about them as anyone. And if we go around saying, let's cut the tenure of the administrators, I mean, let's, let's look at it. If Johnny can't read, is it possible that he might do better with a different teacher and a different administrator? And do the taxpayers of the United States include Christians in their ranks? And is there some way that Christians can regain control of the school system? Of course there is. All you have to do is push, and that great rabbit in Washington will run. Well, the court, somebody said. I heard that. We have an interesting situation with the court. The courts have expanded their authority even faster than the rise of crime. <laughs> but they've expanded their authority over our private lives and not over crime. And the judges are appointed for life. The President of the United States is limited to eight years in office and the judges are appointed for life. This was to keep them from being influenced, believe it or not. But they all come through the screen of the American Bar Association, which is dominated by the left. So nobody else can get on the bench. The Supreme Court, which has been a political plum ever since it was created, and which has long since violated its original charter, is occupied by such men as Thurgood Marshall, and National Review magazine has a new cover on it showing Thurgood Marshall sound asleep because we understand that he sits in his chambers and watches color television all day. And he signs without reading what his clerks produce. Now the court is surrounded by, it, each one of the judges has a whole coterie of bright young law students, average age 26. They assess the case and they write the background and in many cases they write the decision. Knowing the bent of the juror for whom they work, knowing his general opinions and attitudes, they provide the material to which he adds his vote. We have three that are in their 80s on the court and we have others. 
Suppose we were to say to the court, to the judges, you can serve for 12 years, at the end of which time we'll give you a very fat pension, we'll thank you for your service to the nation, we'll forbid you to serve the government again in any capacity, and say goodbye. <laughs> I mean, we have a country of 250, 260 million people. We have enough bright people in this country to replace all the bright people that are presently entrenched wherever. And the purpose of the founders was to create an overthrow, to keep from having a settled aristocracy, to keep from having any group of people get permanent power. Now, our Congress, 98% re-elected, has entrenched itself so that the purpose of the founders in having a Congress that was constantly turning over has been frustrated. Let's look at Congress. The courts will go back to you in a minute. Congress exempts itself from the laws it, practice, it enacts. Now, I would have thought that it would be unconstitutional for any group of men to place themselves outside the law. Yet nobody, so far as I know, has ever challenged the right of congressmen to place themselves outside the laws they enact. Why not? They should be forced to obey the laws they enact and all the laws they have ever enacted on sheer constitutional and ethical grounds. Secondly, the staff of Congress now add up to 25,000 people. 25,000. This is one of the, you wonder, how can these things come out of Congress? Well, how can anything come out of 25,000 people? So I think that the expenditures of Congress should be limited, not for the country, but for the congressmen. How much each congressman should be able to extract from the Treasury and how many people he should have to help him should be severely limited. The Franks should be abolished. Totally. And then let's see what we can say about congressional terms. We have two congressmen now, Senator Armstrong of Colorado and the senator from Vermont, his name escapes me at the moment, who have decided not to run again after their second term. The one in Vermont says no rational man can stand Congress more than 12 years. <laughs> and I think that uh, we should make that a rule. Give them 12 years, six in the House, six terms in the House, two in the Senate, big pension, Goodbye, don't come back in any capacity. We would lose some good men, but we would get a lot more. Now, what would be the effect of these changes? If we change the academy, we would be changing the seedbed of revolution in this country because the media gets its ideas from the academy. And what can we do about the media? Well, one thing we could certainly do is restore the laws of libel and slander. As it stands, I cannot be libeled or slandered by the media because I'm what's called a public figure. I'm a writer, my name is out, and so forth and so on. Well, I think that's unconstitutional because I think everyone enjoys, or should enjoy, the right to confront his accusers, to know what he's charged with, and to answer the charge. To hold some people removed from the laws of libel and slander means that you have denied their constitutional rights and what the founders called inalienable rights and Noah Webster in his 1828 dictionary defined inalienable as a right that cannot be surrendered or taken away what they did to Ollie North they said you come and testify to Congress or we will hold you in contempt and put you in jail so he came. Now they're using what he, they said will give you limited immunity. What was limited about it? He was indicted for what he told them. And what he told them is the basis of the indictment and the basis of the prosecution's case. When it was appealed on Fifth Amendment grounds to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, without a word, denied the appeal. So you have no, in effect, constitutional convention. Well, let's go back to the Constitution anyway. The Puritans went back to the Magna Carta for the rights of Englishmen. 
They credited it with many rights it didn't have, but that's beside the point. It was a great campaign. <laughs> what I am saying, in other words, is that if we pick up the Puritan example and we talk about applying the religious freedoms to which we are heirs to the political system to which we are heirs, that our political system needs reformation as part of the general reformation of our society because we are involved in trying to set up a second reformation and we cannot succeed with this effort if we restrict ourselves to the church. That's what Dr. Kelly was telling you about the Puritans. The Puritans had no chance. The king was against them. All his men were against him. And some of the issues that came up in the Civil War are issues that have recurred here after 400 years. For instance, delegated power. Delegated power. The power of the king. The king, of course, had certain authority. And what King Charles did was assign certain men in his name to go out and get money from the citizens. In the name of the king. Well, we had this at Ashton Oil when I was at Ashton Oil. First of all, they were fined and abused and beaten up for having contributed to Nixon's campaign, which was technically against the law. That led to an IRS investigation in the name of the king, and that led to an SEC investigation in the name of the king, and uh, finally an IRS investigation in the name of the king. And finally, they were going to have a subcommittee headed by Senator Church, whom they called a senator, yeah, Senator Church, who was known in Washington then as Senator Sunday School, because he wasn't big enough to be a church. <laughs> and Senator Sunday School was going into international payments, and he was going to subpoena the chairman. And they said, well, what would you say the chairman ought to say? So I went into the business of delegated powers of the king. Because one of the things the Puritans did was say, we've only got one king or one ruler at a time, and he cannot delegate his powers to anybody else. Otherwise, we would have a multitude of kings, and that's insane. So we would say to Senator Church and his committee, first the IRS, then the SEC, then the fair impost, this or that, everybody came and everybody's the king. Now you come and you're the king and you want to be president and you want to prove your ability to be president by beating up an American in front of his countrymen. And we're here to tell you that there's only one king and there's an end to all this nonsense and it's going to end right here. We're not going to answer any questions, whatever. Well, we've tried everything else. Let's try that. Well, I almost fell dead. <laughs> they never paid any attention to what I said. <laughs> and I went home, and about ten days later, nothing happened, so I called up and said, what happened? They said, well, we showed the statement to the staff, and they tore up the subpoena. All you have to do is stand up. And how could we lose? Thank you very much.